Johnny Tremaine, Chapter 11, Part 2. Before reading, here are three questions to guide you to the key details of the events and the characters within the part. 1. Who exactly does Johnny see all throughout the streets? Number 2. What good news does Johnny receive? And 3. What song do the British play as they march? Part 2. On Cornhill, Johnny could feel the subdued excitement. Everyone knew something was happening. No one knew what. Doors and windows were open, people hanging out, calling back and forth, or gathered in knots in the street. Johnny kept his eyes and ears open. Everyone knew about that secret expedition last night. Colonel Smith had embarked with 700 men and landed in Cambridge. That Gage was sending over at least a thousand fresh troops to support him, anyone might guess. But the people of Boston knew no more than Gage that the fighting had begun. Johnny went to the province house. All was as usual. The sentries were on guard. Young officers lounged about. One was already in his cups. Johnny could see that a group of them were playing at cards in the south parlor. Perhaps they were finishing off the game they had begun last night. He knew which was General Gage's bedroom. The curtains were still drawn. Colonel Smith's early call for reserves evidently had not upset the commanding officer. He had given the order which set Percy's 1st Brigade in motion, had rolled over and gone to sleep. Johnny went to the common. He had already seen the tale of Percy's brigade lashing around Dr. Warren's house. The head of this scarlet dragon lay upon the common. The men were restless, grumbling, spitting, shifting their heavy equipment. Some had already been standing about for three hours. Johnny learned from one of their camp women what was causing the delay. They were waiting to be joined by a detachment of marines. He looked about and saw for himself these 1,200 men were taking with them cannon and baggage wagons. The tension among the inhabitants was growing. What had happened? What was going to happen? Shops and schools were closed, and Johnny met a wreath of tiny children advancing and chanting, School's done, war's begun. It looked to him they were shrewder guessers than their elders, who were trying to believe that not a shot had been fired, or would be fired. Then from over North Boston way came the brisk rattle of drums. The 500 Marines, billeted all about North Square, arrived at double quick. They took their places in the ranks. Some were still buckling their equipment or eating the bread that had been tossed to them. They had been hours late, but when they had been notified, they came fast. Tagging after them, looking half awake and half dressed, Johnny recognized an old acquaintance. It was Madge, even fatter since her marriage and seemingly more in love than ever. Tears streamed down her thick red cheeks and, all old animosity forgotten, she flung herself upon Johnny. I can't bear it, but he says he's got to go. Nearby, tough little Sergeant Gale was strutting about like a bantam cock, roaring at one of his men whose buttons did not shine. He was pretending not to know that his wife was so nearby. He was really showing off in front of her, and approved her presence. Men went to war, and women wept. All was as it should be. Sure he's got to go, Johnny comforted Madge. But people say Gage is just sending out the brigade for exercise. They've been sitting about barracks, catching fleas all winter. Why were the Marines late? Gage sent a letter to Major Pitcairn, telling him to parade his men. But Pitcairn wasn't to home. Pitcairn went off last night, second in command to Colonel Smith. Did you know that? The Marines didn't know until about ten minutes ago. Johnny had to laugh. It certainly would hearten Dr. Warren when he heard how stupid the British had been. Gage had forgotten the Marine Major had already gone, had sent him a letter, 
and then turn over for another snooze. Suddenly, there was silence along the whole great length of the brigade. Slim Earl Percy, on a white horse, escorted by a group of officers, was cantering slowly across the common. Five mounted men. The sun was bright that day, with only breeze enough to ruffle the horses' manes, flaunt scarlet riding capes, float the flag of England. Johnny was an Englishman. The sullen, rebellious people standing about watching Percy and his staff approaching, waiting for the brigade to march. All were Englishmen. That flag, it stood for Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, Charles I's head upon a block, centuries of struggle for English liberty. But over here, there had grown up a broader interpretation of the word liberty. No man to be ruled or taxed except by men of his own choice. But we are still fighting for English liberty, and don't you forget it. French slaves to the north of us, Spanish slaves to the south of us. Only English colonies are allowed to taste the forbidden fruit of liberty. We who grew up under England. Johnny thought of James Otis's words, upholding the torch of liberty, which had been lighted on the fires of England. Not since the soldiers had come to Boston had Johnny removed his hat when the British flag went by, except once when it had been knocked off his head by a soldier. He started to remove it now, for the first time and doubtless the last. Though better of it, he thought better of it. It was too late. He knew the shooting had begun. The sword in Earl Percy's hands flashed. There was a command which was instantly picked up and repeated and echoed and repeated again. The regimental drummers struck up. The artillery horses threw their weight against their collars. Wagoners cracked their whips. And the scarlet dragon swung forward, sluggishly at first, heading for the town gates. Thousands of separate feet merged into only one gigantic pair. Left, right, left, right. The earth shook to their rhythm. Johnny watched them pass. Every button was sewed on, every buckle in place, every cartridge box held exactly 36 cartridges. Every musket had a bayonet, and there was not one old fouling piece among them. Every horse had four new shoes. It was a magnificent sight. But Johnny felt a little sick. What chance, what shadow of a chance had those poor untrained, half-armed farmers at Concord? Oh, God, be with us now. But even as he prayed, he kept an eye out for the regimental markings on the men's uniforms. It was the 4th, the 23rd, and the 47th who were being sent out, plus 500 Marines, plus a small artillery train, and a few baggage wagons. 1,200 for a guess. The drums throbbed. The heavy dragon marched on its thousands of feet, and now above the drums came the shrilling of the fifes. They played a tune. They always played when they wished to insult Yankees. For once more, Yankee Doodle was going to town on a spanking stallion with that forlorn feather in his cap, asking those unmilitary questions. Poor Yankee Doodle. Whatever could he do against this great scarlet dragon?